everybody for joining us here today uh, at Crawl Space Live. We uh, are joined by Billy Jensen, Paul Haynes, and Maggie Freeling. Um, so thank you, everybody. I'm here, too, coming. just yeah. in case. We, we are not joined by Lance today. Um, so the book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, um, the, the true crime hit book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, Billy Jensen and Paul Haynes, you guys had some connection to. So tell us about that. What did you guys do with the book? Uh, I was Michelle's researcher. I began working with her um, from the beginning, and I uh, helped finish the book after she passed, along with Billy Jensen over here. What's going on? Yeah, just talk a little bit closer. Uh, did everyone, did everyone, everyone hear me? All right. Everyone get um, that? Good. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, no, I was um, really good friends with Michelle, and we would meet you know, about once a month, and then she would talk about the Golden State Killer, and I would talk about my cases. And uh, I was constantly telling her, finish this book, because I want her to work on other projects and other cases. And she's like, I'm coming, I'm working, I'm working, I'm gonna get it done, and then, um, and then it happened. Is there anybody out there who is unfamiliar with I'll Be Gone in the Dark or Michelle McNamara? Okay, okay we got three, so that's enough for <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, either one of you, if you want to give a background of Michelle and, and what the uh, book's content is. So the, uh, the book is about a, well, a then unidentified serial killer known as the East Area Rapist Original Night Stalker. Michelle had rechristened this offender the Golden State Killer because it's a less cumbersome name. Um, she had hoped that the case would sort of gain a broader foothold in the public consciousness because this is a case that mysteriously kind of flew under the radar for a long time, given the scope of it. Um, I don't think I have anything. Yeah, and Michelle, Michelle was laser focused on this case and really did, you know, she was a mom. Uh, she was a, could be considered, you know, a, um, a, a housewife because she, uh, she didn't have another job and she was a housewife to a, a, a pretty famous comedian slash actor. And she, um, it was once Alice was put to bed, this is all she did. And much like a lot of you guys probably do, is that she would open up her computer, which she called her escape, her 15 inch escape hatch. And then she dropped down that rabbit hole and depended on what day of the week or what night of the week, what the rabbit hole was. Either it was, she was gonna go after the homework uh, evidence or she was gonna go after uh, the diamond knots or go after, uh, the, going through the yearbooks of Rancho Cordova, all that sort of stuff. So she was very intensely, and we use the word obsessed in the book um, as the subhead, and I, I don't really have a problem with that because it's pretty damn close. I have a question, and I think for a lot of us that do these cases, she kind of touched on it a little bit, but how did it affect her personal relationships? You know, I, I really wasn't there. Um, so I think that... I think for Michelle, the effect was pretty minimal. She was really good at sort of juggling things. I think it took a toll on her health. Um, but, you know, she really had the responsibilities of a wife and a mom that I, I think she managed pretty well. Um, so I, I don't know that there was any significant impact on her personal relationships. I yeah. think that Patton was worried about her, uh, you know, in terms of her health and well, well-being. But it's... Yeah, she, I mean, she knew, and Patton understood too. I mean, she, she would be at, like she talks about in the book, she'd be at a movie premiere and then get a tip and then be like, I'm out of here. You know, I want to yeah. go, I want to go follow this tip. And he knew, you know, it was very much a relationship when he wasn't like, come on, you got to be here and, and smile for the camera. So, uh, um, but yeah, it was de definitely, and we got to see, we got to see crime Michelle, you know, when, when she, she was on with us. And then when she, when she met me for drinks that one day with Nancy Miller, who is our um, our editor, I wrote a story for LA Magazine, uh, and so did she. And she was she we shared editors with her. She was very much on, and like she came and said, I, th I think I solved it through familial DNA. But she had a guy, but it turns out the guy that she had was like ten generations mm -hmm. away, which launched us onto this three or four week odyssey of going through all of these archives and census things from 19th, 17th century England and stuff, trying to match this guy back up. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so we got to see that. We didn't get to see the come down. We didn't get to see, I would just get a text saying it wasn't him or it's, it's, it's deep in there or, or something like that. I never got to see how it really dragged her down when a, when a lead didn't pan out because I, w I wasn't there. I would see her the next month. Can you uh, relate to some of the feelings that she had? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, very much so. You know, the, the feelings that, that she had, in fact, right in the middle of this, where it was so amazing, where we found out that it, it was solved and I was in the middle of doing all of this, this um, uh, all this book stuff and we were actually in Sacramento and I got a text from a detective on this, this case that we're working on in Tampa searching for this girl with a serpent tattoo who shot a guy and I totally thought I got her and it was turns out the tattoo was not was not the right tattoo. Um, she looked really good, it, every, everything matched up except it wasn't the same tattoo so I felt that right then. And I had to, you know, and it was like, it was like for that, for those five minutes, it was like Golden State Killer never happened. It was just like I got to a dark place and then I had to pull myself back up. How what, did, um, oh, sorry. Um, what shape was the manuscript in when, uh, when Michelle passed and, and you guys were brought into this? Or, yeah. uh, I'd say about, I don't know, it was approximately 60% complete. Um, and there was, there was a pretty clear idea of how she wanted to structure it. Uh, I think Bill did a little restructuring, but for the most part, we respected um, kind of the blueprint that she had left with us. Yeah, she, she had, I mean, we had an outline from the, the magazine article, sort of, and that was kind of, kind of along the outline that we followed, but then there was also a matter of, she, she didn't write it linearly, she wrote it in chapters, so it was, it was a matter of just putting the chapters where and when and, um, and how they would make sense, and then there was also stuff that was missing. You know, there were certain, uh, she wasn't going to go into detail every sexual assault. She did want to go into detail every murder. Um, she wasn't able to get to that, so that was a lot of piecing together stuff from her notes and her emails, and her emails were really beautifully written, so that wasn't that hard. I mean, she's a very intimidating writer for a writer to be looking at. I couldn't write my own stuff for, like, during that whole time just because she was so good. Yeah. yeah, I don't think she wanted this case, to, this book rather, to be like a definitive case resource. Um, there, there was a previous book called Sudden Terror written by one of the in retired investigators that does sort of endeavor to provide a comprehensive attack, account of every attack, and it quickly becomes tedious as literature. Um, there's a sameness to all these attacks, and there's a lot of them. There's about four dozen. And so once you reach like the fifth or sixth it, with the same MO, um, you sort of want to put the book down. You know, and I, I think Michelle wanted to uh, sort of intercut her own narrative with that of the case to make it um, compelling. Yeah, the, the the book itself is, if anyone hasn't read it, hasn't read it, uh, give it a give. It, I mean, do yourself a, a favor. It's it's terrifying. It's beautifully written, and it's sad in retrospect. And then it it's like bittersweet now that the killer has been caught. And Tim was saying that you know he was about three quarters of the way through the book when he learned about uh, the Golden State Killer being caught, and all of a sudden it just things things read a lot differently yeah. in and retrospect. Did you just, did, were you just driving down the street and you just threw the book out the window? You were just like, <laughs> this, is, this is bullshit. No, I, I what I I shot out of bed when I found out, and I uh, r ran downstairs and I showed my girlfriend the book. I was like, you know this book I'm reading? It just got solved. I did the same yeah. thing. <laughs> She's like, no way, and she doesn't care about any of the stuff that I do, but she was actually interested in that. Moment. I had just finished it the day before, so to me it was like, what? What a different experience, yeah. though, reading the book, uh, or even just the last fourth, as, as I did, um, with the case having been solved. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a much, it's just a huge difference. Well, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think part of that is, sorry to interrupt you, no. but part of that is, uh, is that she had written that once, once we know him, all his power is going to be gone. Yeah. So in a sense, it's kind of like seeing Jaws in the beginning of the movie, now that we know what he looks like. And yep. in a sense, that power is taken away to, to a certain extent. People are still writing, but it, it's definitely leveled off, even though a lot more people just, wrote, just bought the book in the last two weeks. People are still writing. I've got to lock my doors, lock my windows on Twitter and stuff. Uh, why did I start reading this at night? All that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Or listening to it at night, because actually a lot of people are listening to it. But it's, uh, and if you call up me or Paul, we'll actually read it to you. That's one of the things that we do. <laughs> but uh, we'll take turns. We, we signed the worst contract. I, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, but it's, it's definitely less and less. It's less people that are doing that. You know? Yeah. I just want to back up a little bit and talk about Michelle. How did, how did you both come to know Michelle uh, through her blog? She was like the original citizen detective, right? One of? One of them, yeah. I, and, you know, we connected online. We were both doing similar work on this case, and I think we both kind of developed a mutual admiration 
Um, it was a true crime diary, right? True crime diary. Does that correct. still exist in some form? It, it's still online, yeah. If you're interested in going on to it and reading Michelle's uh, archive, there's like, I don't know, 150, 200 cases that she covered. So if you liked I'll Be Gone in the Dark, there's, uh, there's more of the same on True Crime Diary. So you reached out to her independently? You were reading her blog? I think she reached out to me. Oh, no kidding. Um, yeah, I, I don't quite remember the, the sequence of who contacted who, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember her saying something like, you're my favorite favorite commenter on that particular message board yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I'm a big fan of your, of your comments, yeah, because yeah. Paul knew the case like the back of his hand. And uh, me, for me, I was, in, uh, I was in Los Angeles and I was starting a, a podcast. This is back before Serial even. And uh, I just did a search for a uh, Los Angeles crime blogger, and she came up. And then I, I had read the Golden State Killer story, and I remember reading it saying, damn, I wish I wrote this story. And I didn't realize it was her. Oh, wow. So then we, that's how we started, and that was like 2012, 13. So compared to other citizen detectives, which thank you for uh, introducing us to that phrase, because we use it all the time, mm -hmm. how good was Michelle? I, she, I think she was. No, happy. Michelle yeah. was good enough for all of the Golden State Killer investigators to pretty much share everything with her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and she, she didn't leak either. Yeah, she didn't leak. She uh, so she wasn't grabbing something, and then if somebody told her something in confidence, she wasn't going right out and tweeting it or blogging it. Uh, she was her her greatest asset was the ability to get all of these different uh, police departments who never really talked to each other before to share information. That's insane. That just doesn't happen, and it had to happen in this case. So, um, the, that, and that's what she did. She said, you know what, we're going out to lunch together. We're all going out, I'm gonna buy you guys drinks and we're gonna do this thing. That, you know, on top of the, the other stuff that you see a lot of other people doing, which is, you know, the computer research and the data dive and everything. And, you know, the thing about citizen detectives is, and the way that it works the best for, for crowd solving and crowdsourcing, is that everybody has their, the, the thing that they're best at, you know? And, um, whether it's data mining or geographic profiling or somebody's really into forensic artistry, uh, you know, hers were really those connections and being able to get people to talk to her, which is an incredibly hard thing to do. And she's really less interested in writing a book or writing an article um, than she was identifying this per perpetrator. You know, and she was even less interested in being the one to solve the case. She simply wanted to know who this person was. And everything else was sort of secondary and existed to enable her access to information. I think the book was primarily just a vehicle for her to, uh, you know, investigate this case. Do you think, knowing who he is now, that if she saw him and knew who he was, she'd be like, yeah, that's what I expected? No, I don't think so. I think it would be simultaneously satisfying in that this person does flout expectations and also rather anticlimactic. And for me, D'Angelo is like a stranger. And when you look at a case like this for four, five, six, or 10 years, in some cases, uh, Paul Holes has worked on this case for 20 years, you develop this, this weird intimacy with this question mark, with this kind of silhouette. And D'Angelo is a person with a name, and he's not exactly the image I had in mind. And it's like I'm being reacquainted with the case, mm -hmm. like from mm -hmm. square one. You know, we had always talked about how when you're when you're working on a case, and cops talk like this too, it's that, um, I, I don't necessarily like this analogy that much because it's not necessarily like falling in love, but you say, you use terms like that. Do you like this guy for this? Oh, I like this guy a lot. I'm liking this guy, that kind of thing. He looks good, he looks good for this. And uh, you know, I think there was, as far as the things that he, that he was doing, a lot of people were very much into the whole idea of him being involved in real estate or construction. But, uh, you know, the idea that he was a police officer wasn't completely off the map. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, she, Michelle always said sort of two things. One, it was always the handyman. So she, she would always like go sort of to that. So either he was a handyman, which she thought he was probably a little bit bigger than that, or she was, he was somebody that either uh, wanted to be a cop and couldn't be a cop, or like, and then had to be a security guard or something like that, like wanted some sort of authority but wasn't able to get it. And it turns out it was both. It was that he was a cop and then he was thrown out of being a cop. So my, approach, uh, my approach to unsolved cases and cases like this is, and, and I think you had said the same thing, Bill, which is that of Occam's razor, you know, and that's the, the principle is that the simplest explanation of an unexplained event is usually the correct one more often than not. And in this case, it turns out Occam's razor just didn't apply. This guy didn't live in Sacramento County. Uh, he was older than everyone thought he would be. His surname was Italian when the DNA indicated British ancestry. 
Um, so I think that's why this person, one of many reasons, or three of many reasons, that this person has escaped you know, everyone's radar. And I believe last time I was on your show, I brought up Occam's Razor for another case. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I still do believe in that <laughs> because yeah. uh, we're talking about the Maura Murray case because uh, that, that's just the thing that makes, makes the most sense as opposed to that there was a serial killer walking around that day. And, you know, like Occam's Razor states that, like, once you're able to eliminate all of those, like, most elementary possibilities, then you move on to the more complicated ones. And with this, like, um, you never would have eliminated that, that simplest configuration because there, it just yielded an endless number of potential suspects. And this guy never would have been one of them. Hmm. Have you talked to any law enforcement that, uh, you know, has been like, yeah, or like who maybe knew him back in the day? Has any of that come up yet? Um, no, none of the investigators on this case, nobody who investigated this case was aware of him. Um, some of his colleagues at the Exeter Police Department and the Auburn Police Department have spoken publicly. Um, but Exeter, his police chief there, said that he was super serious. He didn't fit in with the other uh, cops who like to kind of joke around in their downtime, and he would never would be a part of that. And with Auburn, he was known as Junk Food Joe because he's always eating chips or you know some kind of crap, drinking soda, much like the stereo rapist would do um, when right. in the victims' homes. Uh, and he was also described as a space violator, like a close talker. He would move in really close and put his hand on your shoulder when he talked to you. People like that have always made my skin crawl. I don't know about you. I like that word, space violator. That's a good word. <laughs> yeah. So he was fired from being a police officer when he got caught shoplifting a hammer and dog repellent. Yes. That's and right. this was three years into his series of rapes? That's right. 79, yeah. yeah. It was uh, July was, of 79. Yeah. Did that, like, like someone had to fire him. Did that oh, yeah. not set off red flags for the person who fired him? That it should have. Yeah, it should have. Yeah, um, that's the biggest thing. And he's embarrassed. You know, the chief is embarrassed about that. Yeah, and in retrospect, the, the chief believes that D'Angelo had planned to kill him because his daughter saw somebody looking in a bedroom window with a flashlight. Yeah, I just got yeah. goosebumps. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, when you see, I don't know if you've ever followed any trials, I mean, certainly trials now with, with police and then go on trial for actually killing somebody, and then, you know, the police union gets behind him, and, and there's, it's a whole to-do. This guy gets caught, and he, he basically, he does a little bit of an appeal, but basically says, all right, you know what, I'm, I don't want them looking into me. I'm going to walk away from this and walk away from his job. You never see that. That's the biggest thing. The one thing is, all right, dog repellent and a hammer, those are used in break-ins. That's a little weird. Maybe he's just like that or whatever, uh, you know, just is, is lazy. Um, maybe he's moonlighting as a, as a mailman, who knows, and a carpenter. But, um, but the other, but, but, not, but not fighting it was the thing that, it's, that should have been, right. that should have been the red flag. Had some dogs had been attacked by that point? A number of dogs have been attacked. A number, okay. Yeah, yeah, there we're, were trying to we're trying to nail down how many dogs he actually killed. Um, there was a dog that. shortly after his firing in Santa Barbara. Um, this is the first uh, evidence of a presence in Santa Barbara. Um, there was a woman out walking her dog one night um, when the dog uh, ran between two houses and then came back about five minutes later with a stab wound. It was basically eviscerated. Uh, it was taken to the vet. It survived. Um, but, you know, there was nothing behind the house, no object that could have caused that. So it was believed that a prowler had stabbed the dog. Yeah. Was that the one that was in the book? Yeah, in the same neighborhood as the, uh, all of the Santa Barbara attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, what he's done, and you can add animal cruelty and animal murder to the list, what he's done is just mind-blowing, and it's so tough for me, and I don't know about anybody else, but it's so tough to wrap my head around all of the things that made me, that got under my skin in horror movies that he did before horror movies were even influent. Like the, the, he slasher was doing, movies. Slasher movies. He was doing things that Halloween, Halloween came out in 1978. He was doing things before Halloween came out and before um, When a Stranger Calls come, came out. He was doing those things. He didn't have the influence of the media to, to direct him in, in that. He, he made that shit up. And, and I think he saw himself as a character in a horror movie. The title, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, those are words that he used. He said to the victim, you know, if you don't cooperate, I'll uh, kill you and I'll be gone in the dark. Or I'll, I'll stab this knife through you and I'll be gone in the dark. He used variations on that phrase uh, two or three different times. Yeah, and then even when we found out about how he was as a neighbor... Um, complaining about a neighbor's dog and saying, I'm going to bring a load of death on you. You know, it's just, that's, those are, those are like Charles Bronson uh, movie not titles. A, not a pleasant guy. Well, so can you elaborate on that a little uh, bit? Because yeah. I'm so curious, you know, he has a family right now, or had, had a family, I suppose. Um, what do we know about them and his life 
you know, in his later years. Does anybody suspect anything? Was he a weird guy? I don't think his family suspected anything. I mean, his wife, he and his wife separated in 91. She was an attorney. Um, his oh. daughters are all fairly successful, and they hadn't even heard of this case. Yeah. Have you talked to them? or? I, I haven't talked to them. No. no. I, I think their, their, their privacy should probably be respected. Yeah. They're victims as much as anyone else in this yeah. case. We'll, we'll get into privacy issues a little bit later, Paul. Don't, don't jump oh, ahead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, w when he got caught, this was such a moment on Twitter, I just want to say. It, it, was, it was incredible because there was no news covering this the moment it happened. Uh, the, there was no articles being written about it. It was uh, your guys' Twitters and Mike Morford uh, from the Criminology Podcast Twitters that I was going to. And we texted Maggie that morning. She's like, I, I, I've Googled it. I found nothing. And we're like, follow Billy Jensen. Yeah, that's why <laughs> I, like, I followed you. Yeah. <laughs> Like, how, what, what was that day like? I mean, I, I also noticed your Twitter followers jumped by, like, they did, several yeah. thousand. They 7, did, They did, and now they're like, why is he tweeting about Happy Meal toys? And I'm like, that's what I do. You know, it's, it's crime and Happy Meal toys, and that's what you're going to get. But uh, we had just gotten back from a, a book event where all four of us were in the same room for the first time. It was myself, Patton, Paul, and uh, Gillian Flynn. And it was, it was a great event. It was in basically Michelle's hometown. Michelle's family was there. We got the question of whether we think it'll ever be solved, and we said yes. You know, Paul thought it was... Paul, gave, 2020, it, Paul gave it to 2020. Yeah. I gave it five the years. The year, not the show. Yeah. And uh, I, um, you know, it was, it was just great, but we, we had an after party. We, well, only sh we showed up for it, didn't even have a drink because uh, some people were tired. Then we went, we went back to the hotel, and I got a text message about one in the morning, so I got like an hour of sleep. And then I had to... Before I tweeted it out, I confirmed it. So, uh, and then after that, you know, I confirmed it with Debbie, um, and I confirmed it with, uh, uh, law enforcement. And then I said, all right, well, if they, if they call the victim's family and said, this is happening and there's a press conference and he's, and he's in custody, this has to be true. And I believed her. So, uh, then I put it out and said, all right, yeah, this is, this is happening. Yeah, that's wild to think that while you were at the book event, there were so many like, like c circumstances, so many moments that happened that seemed to fall in line in a serendipitous fashion, but while you were at this book event and while you were at the after party, there was a task force of police that were planning this. Yeah, at yeah. the very same time. At the very same time. It's nuts. And we learned about it that night. And as nice as it was to learn about it in advance, I, I really wish I'd been able to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys know, though, that they were doing the DNA testing? Were no. no. I mean, we, we, there was con we constantly putting in, put it, doing the DNA testing. Yeah. So, but we didn't know they had a pretty good match. We had no of a third this. cousin, yeah. and th yeah, we had no into this. They kept it very close to the vest, yeah. and it happened very quick. So that was one of the other things too. That there wasn't a because Paul, you know, he had talked to us too, but especially with Michelle, he would tell Michelle, "I've got a good one," you know. And Michelle was uploading to uh, Y Search, which is another one like Jed Match, and um, finding people and saying, "This guy looks good. This guy looks good." That kind of thing. So, but no, there was no ramp up to this at all. We were completely in the dark. If it had been a slower burn, we no probably point. would have found out about it, or at least like to think. But it, it just happened within, I think, six days um, from the point that he was, um, maybe yeah. even fewer. I think yeah. it happened on the 20th that the DNA had, um, uh, was confirmed, and then he was arrested the 24th. It's just crazy because we just wait for that morning for us that, like, Art gets the text from the police, and then it's oh just, like, God. it's on. Like, we, You're talking about the Mara Mara case. Yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, we wait for that moment every mm -hmm. day. We were uh, talking to Mike Morford uh, earlier on today, and he described how they how they captured him, how they set up this little scenario where he got a you know he actually instigated an argument with one of the people that the police had planted there, yeah. and then because they wanted his guard to be down, and then they they came up behind him while he had no idea, and he seemed surprised, and. He said that he had a pot roast cooking, right? I have a roast in the oven. A roast, a roast in, the, in the, oven. the oven. Like, my roast is going to burn. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and he also said it in a very high voice, the high voice that he used to use with a lot of the victims. Like, I have a roast in the oven. Like, that kind of, like, oh kind of like that, God. yeah. Jeez. Was there, has there been a connection yet with any of the survivors or victims to him? Because I know there was, Michelle mentioned in the book, maybe he was targeting some of the men. Um, has there been any connections made? None that we found. No. Doesn't, right. doesn't Other than, I mean, we think because he was, I mean, he still was, I mean, it still was 20, um, you know, 20 miles away. 
I think he he might have seen some of them in certain places. But no, like I mean, Jane connection. Jane Jane definitely thinks that he saw her. Um, maybe, maybe he saw her because he used uh, the officers' club and called it the O Club, um, and saw her there. You know, but uh, there was no sort of personal connection. It's not like we have the first one and he attacked the first one and then then he went on to strangers or anything like that. We got nothing. So I found the uh, geographic profiling pretty uh, interesting and really impressive. How close were, were, was your profile to his actual residence? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't. He lived in Auburn, so that's something none of us could have anticipated. However, he had family all throughout the areas in which he had attacked. Uh, he had lived in, as a, as a teenager, in Rancho Cordova, not in Cordova Meadows, which is the neighborhood in which um, the attacks were clustered, but nearby. Uh, and his, you know, so in 1970, he was engaged to be married to a woman named Bonnie, which is significant because during one of the rapes, these dare rapists began sobbing and saying, I hate you, Bonnie. Um, so when we discovered that he was engaged to a woman named Bonnie and never married her, we just, you know, thought that's, that's of some significance. And Bonnie, in 1976 and 77, during the peak of the series, was living right where Kim Rosmo put his, uh, his anchor point. But, but he wasn't living there. He was living next county over. Yeah, so a lot of it is, and we would always say it, it, it's where you either lived, worked, or played. And played could mean anything. You have a friend there, you had a girlfriend there, you would st stay around there. But there was something about that just because, especially the way that he was attacking this area that kind of created like a crescent moon type of um, uh, shape. Why wasn't it going to other places? And there, were, there was... There was a method to that madness, and one of it was that he knew that neighborhood, and he knew all the ins and outs of that neighborhood. He was very much about escape routes. Also, his in-laws lived all throughout Carmichael and Citrus Heights. And you said um, the, there was a method to the madness. Do you, do you think that he was, and you, you both can give your, your opinions on it, do you think he was particularly smart? Would you call him a, a, like a genius serial killer or offender because he got away with it for so long? Mm, I'm always loath to call them geniuses. Um, I think uh, you know, Gary, Ridge, Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, before he was identified, some thought he was a genius. Uh, and you know, as it turns out, he's like borderline retarded. And I don't mean that you know, in a facetious sense. He literally, his IQ is like 75. Mm. Um, so I think that when you do something for a certain number of hours, and you'll probably bring Gladwell into this, um, <laughs> You know, you get good at it, even if you're not innately intelligent. Uh, with this offender, I, I think he was pretty smart. Um, you know, I think he's smarter than we we anticipated he would be. Yeah, remember, I mean, if he has if he has 50 sexual assaults and uh, and 12 murders, you know, he had done this a lot. He had broken into houses a lot more than that. And then you add the uh, Visalia stuff as well, that he had broken into hundreds and hundreds of houses and nobody even knew. And he probably had a lot of targets that he broke into and thought, you know what, I don't have enough, I don't have enough escape routes in this one. I'm not going to do this one, even though I might have, you know, seen seen the woman around and liked the way that that she looked. So he was very much making sure that um, because when it did go awry, uh, it went awry, and then he 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 stopped stop working there, you know, and would go someplace else because, and it did that happened a couple times, and then he would go someplace else. Is it true he was in the one of the burglary units in one of the police Yeah, forces. so uh, it's becoming evident that he was the Visalia ransacker, whom we've long suspected might be the same mm -hmm. offender. And while he was the Visalia ransacker, he was on the anti-burglary unit in, uh, in Exeter, the Exeter Police Department. That's so uh, he was solving them and he was doing them. Which is kind of like Ted Bundy, and I just realized this yesterday. You know, Ted Bundy was, in, was lobbying for uh, like hitchhiker rights at one point. Uh, yeah. D'Angelo also got, he studied criminology yeah. at Sac State. It's crazy. Yeah. What has your uh, interactions been with some of the surviving victims? Uh, you know, it's it's been it's been a positive experience for me because when you just know these people from police reports, uh, they're kind of homogenous, and you know, meeting them and um, I mean, they're they're quite wonderful people, and each with their own distinct personality and and uh, you know, sense of humor that does not emerge in the dry the dryly rendered you know, like soup can instruction style writing of, of a, you know, police report. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had to go on HLN and uh, I was very surprised to see Jane there and Jane uh, gave me a big hug and it was just great. And she's got such a great sense of humor about everything and, um, and even had it before too. It wasn't like it was just like, you know, but she's, it's definitely, there was a giddiness to her that was just so great to see. Yeah, that, that is really remarkable to hear because when you read about 
what he did, like the psychological torment, was just as bad as the physical torment. I think that was more important for him. I think he was primarily like a domestic terrorist. And I think that inflicting fear and exerting control over victims was, was the primary a pleasure point for him. The rape was, and the victims often reported that the rape was very like perfunctory. It was over very quickly. He didn't seem very excited. Um, but he spent, you know, upwards of two, three hours in some of these homes, just being there, ransacking it, toying with the victims, and, and you know that combined with the recon and surveillance that he did, I, I think those were the you know, primary thrills for him. Moms are important, as you know, Lance. All moms deserve to be loved. We had an incredible mom on these airwaves in Doreen Quinn Giuliano, John Juca's mom, of course, the wrongfully convicted John Juca. This mom went undercover to try to prove his innocence. Talk about unconditional love right there. On top of many other things, jewelry, gifts. Justice. Doreen Giuliano, she deserves flowers for Mother's Day, Lance. But don't all moms deserve more than just one day? Absolutely. When you send her pro flowers for Mother's Day, which is just around the corner, she's guaranteed to have at least seven days of fresh, beautiful flowers. And right now, our listeners can send 100 colorful blooms with a free glass vase for just $19.99 plus shipping and handling with our promo code CRAWLSPACE. With fresh flowers, guaranteed delivery, and unique vases and accessories that mom will love, Pro Flowers has everything you need to get your Mother's Day shopping done for all the moms you know. Just choose the delivery date you want, and it's guaranteed. You can even get your gift delivered on Mother's Day, May 13th. There is only one way to get 100 colorful blooms with a free glass vase for just $19.99, and that way is to visit proflowers.com. Click on the blue microphone in the upper right corner and use our code CRAWLSPACE. That's proflowers.com code CRAWLSPACE. There was also a, a, a town hall meeting at one point where... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about this. But I'm they, probably going to be correcting you. <laughs> yeah, actually, maybe, maybe you should just uh, tell it because what, what I'm, I'm going to say is he did, did he follow someone home or? So um, the story has often been mistold as, you know, there was a man, a gentleman who stood up at one of the community meetings and was like, you know, I can't believe these men just, you know, helplessly allow their spouses or, you know, significant others to be raped. I, you know, if he did that to me, I would attack, I, you know, whatever. And then that this man became a victim um, shortly after. The, the actual, what actually happened is this community meeting took place before this, the media blackout, the blackout was even lifted. So, you know, only a small number of people, you know, in these communities knew about these attacks. And the offender hadn't graduated onto attacking couples. So this man never would have said that. Now, uh, according to Richard Shelby, um, this, this would be this man who later became a victim did actually um, engage with the cops and it was contentious. Um, but, you know, he wasn't targeted until like eight or nine months later. And I, I feel it was just a coincidence. But he was probably at that meeting, though, right, D'Angelo? Or we don't know. Well, we don't know. And, oh, okay. and I, I feel that it may have been purely coincidental. No, and that was one of the things that we had. When, when the book came out before it was solved, we had a lot of people emailing us with their favorite uh, suspects and then pictures of people at that meeting and saying, you know, very much like a, like a Kennedy assassination, Zapruder <laughs> film. Like, look in the guy in the, in the bushes. There's a guy with a rifle in the bushes. They're still doing it. Yeah, they're still, and there's, it still hasn't stopped, That's even though. That's a pretty though, crazy yeah. coincidence, though, no? It w um, it's, not, it's not hugely a crazy, well, we haven't seen his photo, though. Oh, the, the coincidence that he, uh, that the man had, the had man spoken that up, and that, up, yeah. sure. Well, the photo that circulated is from a different community meeting, you know, that, that, That's true. So, okay. I, you know, when, w w with a case like this, there are a lot of data points. There's a lot of information, yeah. and it's inevitable you're going to see intersections and, and coincidences that really don't mean anything. Yeah. So the chapter in the book called The One was uh, particularly interesting to me because uh, Michelle and, and probably you guys uh, wrote about several different um, persons of interest. I think it was three or four. And each one of them, it was like, how is this not the guy? Yeah. Yeah. 
And they, <laughs> they were better looking suspects than D'Angelo. We had hundreds of people that were better looking suspects than D'Angelo. So, I mean, it's still astonishing to me. I'm still processing the fact that this is the guy. Yeah. Is that something that's really common in, uh, in murder cases? No, <laughs> not really. No. Yeah, I guess that's a question that I never even thought to ask you, you both. Um, th it comes out, it's D'Angelo, and you just said you're still trying to process that this is the, this is the guy, when yeah. after you've had so many other ones that were I much better looking. I accept it is. I don't doubt that. Right. I'm just still wrapping my brain around it. Yeah, I mean, definitely once we saw him and, uh, and, and it started unraveling that night when we were going through the, news, the old newspaper articles, and uh, my jaw dropped when I saw uh, the story about the the shoplifting, that was when I said, that was when I believed it because I didn't believe, it just sounded weird, especially the last name, that it was an Italian last name because we thought we were looking for something that's, that was Germanic or British. Some of us, you know, we rejected the connection between Visalia and the East Area Rapists. Um, and one of the reasons is that the physical descriptions were so fundamentally different. But now, looking at what D'Angelo looked like in 73, he looked a lot like the Ransacker. And then he lost a significant amount of, uh, amount of weight. And in 79, yeah. looked pretty much how the East Area Rapist was described. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, the photos do look different. Yeah. Um, you know, I know you can't now, but in a few years down the line, w are you guys going to try and talk to him? At some point, yeah. You want I to. Mean, there, there are probably three or four hundred questions that still need to be answered, and only he can answer those questions. What do you make of his state now, his condition? Um, because he sort of looks like either he's heavily medicated or he's playing a... Uh, Playing a, you know, he's incapacitated. Yeah, I think it's a little card. Bit, well, I think I think it's a little bit of both. I, I believe they're wheeling him in the wheelchair because it's just it's practical. They can secure his hands and move him around easily. Uh, he looks like he's heavily sedated, um, but you know, I think he's also uh, playing into it. I think he's leaning into it. Um, in interrogations, he's been completely catatonic. In fact, um, uh, some of the, my sources have claimed he just he sits there motionless for like 40, 50 minutes at a time. You know, and this is probably what he did. Uh, when fleeing scenes, you know, when being pursued by um, investigators. I think he was able to find a spot and, you know, hide in a, a thick bush and just be completely motionless. I think he had that discipline, you know, particularly having, having served in the Navy. Yeah. I'm um, never going to sleep again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just said that you, um, your sources told you, what, who do you have for sources? Uh, I, I well, they their <laughs> don't laugh. I, I would have named them instead of just saying sources. <laughs> yeah, we, but we have their social security numbers, please. <laughs> my, they're I, credible. I, okay, yeah. yeah, these are people that you yes. you've worked with before. Uh, oh yeah. And, okay, cool, yeah. cool. Um, it's not John Smith. No, 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 no. no okay. It's not the guy on the street. For no, the purposes it's... of the podcast, it's John Smith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So these, uh, these privacy issues with, with these DNA sites has kind of become this, uh, this hot button issue over the past week. Um, and, and the site that's credited for helping uh, catch this uh, son of a bitch is a really small uh, DNA matching site, right? It's like open match source. DNA. That's what's so crazy. It's small like, and it's open source, chances? yeah. So yeah. how do you guys feel about uh, these privacy concerns and um, I'm so annoyed by like the 23 and me's yeah. like saying like being real proud about this whole thing. Well, we were they're not. Yeah, well, uh, proud of not of not letting people. Uh, yes. See right. That yeah. No. They, that's they, that's what they've he means. Yeah. very quickly asserted. No, it wasn't us. I mean, the ancestry it wasn't us. Yeah, because obviously the first thing people see because they do advertising is 23 and me and ancestry, and we we talked about it. We talked about ways of getting his DNA into those systems. Because the, the sample set, your, your DNA, I think I write this in the book, the DNA is only as good as your sample size of, of, and the database that you're con trying to compare it to. The open source ones that were out there, like Y Search and like Deadmatch, um, you know, 500,000, somewhere around there, when Ancestry was like 2.5 million, it's probably bigger now, but 2.5 uh, million and 23andMe um, was about, a, you know, close to 2 million. And we thought, I, I knew that's what was, where it was going to be. I thought, what I thought was, and this sounds awful, but I thought there was going to be some horrible case that was going to open it up and be like, you know what, there's a guy out there killing people, we need to open this up now, and then the floodgates would open. Which is kind of like what happened in New York with the jogger, uh, Karina Vitrano. So Karina Vitrano was murdered. They, don't ha they didn't have familial DNA within the, um, within the corrections database. 
and uh, you know, so you couldn't you could search for the actual person, but if you found a brother or a cousin or something like that, you weren't allowed to you know follow it down that rabbit hole. Because of Karina Vitrano's family, you know, fighting that, they were getting ready to vote for it. They actually caught the guy right before it, but it did vote and go through. So you have places that have at least for the criminals, uh, you have familial, uh, you know, and that's a smaller subset and a smaller uh, database, but. And these are the, the two most liberal states in the country, which is New York and California, have it. Um, those are the places that you would think would want to fight it. So what is so what is the concern? You know, wouldn't you want to be like, yes, we're helping solve crime? So what is the precedent or the concern for opening that up? Well, it's like an open question to you. Like, if if, you, if the notion of you know you submitting your DNA to site like Jet Search and resolving like I. Fingering a, a third cousin whom you've never met as uh, you know a long unidentified serial murderer. I mean, would that deter you? It wouldn't deter me. I, I would no, but that's what I'm wondering. Why is 23 Man Ancestry seeming like? Why are they the ones that are? Well, that's how corporations think. They they yeah. think in terms of you know like whom are we going to alienate? Like what kind of revenue are we going to lose? I don't think they think in terms of real ethics really. Yeah. Can we can we ask the audience here? Like who who has submitted their own DNA to these sites? Okay, so about a dozen or so. And who would be really upset if you found out that they used it for this purpose? Zero. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, wouldn't yeah, you that, like to know that? Yeah. You're at CrimeCon. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're gonna be on. You're gonna be on a panel next year potentially. <laughs> <Yeah>. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's one of the big things, and that's actually where it's popped up the biggest. Is is that is the is the adoption stuff, and that was my my biggest fear. Whenever anybody would ask me if this guy was going to be caught, I would say absolutely, and then in the back of my head, I would always say unless he was adopted, because then the names wouldn't match up or whatever. But um, that has been before this case. It's been that. It's been the people that have signed adoption, you know, gave away their child and didn't want anything any, anything going on there, didn't want to be linked, and then this would link them back, and then that goes there. So. And so, don't worry about your dad being a serial killer because they just caught the guy who literally <laughs> committed every crime that ever happened in, <laughs> since 1970. <laughs> Do you hate him? Do I hate him? I mean... He's a bad person. Uh, I don't think this is the sort of thing that really arouses my passion. You know, I, he, he's an anomaly. He's a person who targeted strangers for his own, you know, sexual and psychic satisfaction. What, whom I really hate are people that are in positions of power. Lance, that that <laughs> abuse that power and hurt millions of people. You know, that those are people that I hate. I mean, this is someone who is sick and unrelatable and. Um, he's evil, for sure, but I don't know, I, I, I'd be lying and playing to a certain, like, you know, um, uh, dem right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hate him because of the fact that, I will hate him if he doesn't talk, if, if there, because I, I definitely think he did more crimes, so not being able to answer those crimes, especially if they were homicides, but also um, sexual assaults, and th there would be a little bit of a hate there, I'm not a hateful person, but... You know, whenever you got, it was kind of like with 23andMe and Ancestry when I was, I was hating them a little bit too because I knew that there was probably the answer behind this locked door. The locked door was right there. Mm -hmm. and we just, we just, it was locked. We just couldn't do anything about it. So, so you kind of just answered it, but I was going to ask both of you, what, what would be like your first, your, you sit down with him and it's like your first question to him. You go yeah, first. Mine would be, or what else is out there? I mean, obviously, I'd want to get a rapport with him and all that stuff and talk about, you know, uh, right. the things that we have in common. You know, like, hey, we both like yelling at people or, or, or kind of... <laughs> pot roast. I don't know. Yeah, pot roast, you know. <laughs> uh, but, um, Who doesn't like pot roast? Yeah, uh, but I think the, um, I, that's my biggest thing right now, and that's one of the things that we're going to be focusing on tomorrow um, is where he was, when he was there, and what other crimes occurred there. Because that's honestly the first thing I thought of after... I confirmed it was like, all right, what else is out there? Because for me, it's it, he goes away now. I don't, I don't care anymore. I just want to know um, what else is out there. Yeah. I'd stuff. like to know why he killed the Majorities if he did. Um, that crime yeah. has always been inexplicable to me. I'd like to know where he, he, what he did with the items that he stole from victims. I have just a list. I have a list of questions. Do list. Um, I do have a list, yeah. And this is only like a small number of, of questions that I'd like to ask him. But How long do you think it'll take before you can, you can actually... 
talk to him. I, I may never. I mean, you know, from what I understand, he's not taking visitors. Uh, he's not talking to anybody. He's not engaging. Well, um, yeah, I, I, now I there's would, like a case against him, so he right, really wouldn't. Well, yeah, but but I, I also suspect that he's not going to be someone who yields a whole, who wants to provide a whole lot of insight into why he did what he did. I think that if they strike some sort of plea deal with him where it's like, well, we'll take the death penalty off the table and put you in a nicer prison if you uh, cooperate, if you give us full disclosure, well, then maybe he'll talk. But I don't think he's going to be like Raider. Raider loves attention, loves yeah. talking. I was talking with Bobby Chacon before about Israel Keys, about how he just loved to talk about the stuff that he did. So, I'm, I, you know, it's... Also, D'Angelo, we know, has a very small penis. So I don't think he's going to really want to embrace... No, that's a fact. That's actually it is a, a fact. fact. <laughs> this is a fact. But it is still funny. Yeah, they were actually... Yeah, of course. Uh, last week, his public defender was trying to bar photographs of his penis being taken and the judge was like no no uh he's he's gonna you know i don't know how to finish the sentence but <laughs> no he's, yeah. he's, <laughs> he's, he's gonna do it he's and, gonna yeah. he's gonna yeah. do it he's gonna go yeah. full monty yeah. so i this might this, this might be a little bit of an unanswerable question but how many more people are out there that are like this guy I think they're growing rarer and rarer. I think that he is the product of a specific point in our culture, the 40s and 50s, when you know I think our attitudes towards sex and the human body were very pur puritanical. Uh, parenting styles were more author uh, authoritarian than they are now, and um, you know that sort of crashed into the sexual liberation of the 60s and 70s, when you know um, women were were comfortably embracing their sexuality and also making themselves vulnerable in a way that they really hadn't, you know, hitchhiking, communal living. And um, I think people like this, you know, who had a predisposition, were born with this predisposition to psychopathy, um, you know, were both sort of incensed by this new culture and saw it as like a hunting ground, you know. Um, most of the psychopaths now have moved into like business and politics and leadership. And, you know, mm -hmm. budding serial killers are caught very early on. Well, and now they're DNA. mass shooters, you know. They're yeah. mass yeah. shooters now, you know. You have to look at the cultural conditions that, you know, contribute to that. Yeah, I mean, that you know, you've got these, these idiot ISIL guys that are going off and saying, you know, all right, I can't, I can't find a girlfriend, so I'm going to go and shoot a bunch of people. Uh, would those people have turned into serial killers before? Probably, you know, or, or at least something along those lines. It's, it's, it, it seems like... Uh, it was also a lot harder. And you also had a lot of, you know, we can keep track of people a lot more with social media and everything. I think where you're seeing the serial killers and you consider to see the serial killers, they're going to be sex worker killers, and that's what they're doing. And, uh, you know, when they're getting caught at four or five, they're not going up to the tens and twenties and thirties. And also porn is a lot more accessible now than it was in like the seventies. And I think that these people probably can sate their impulses with that. And they, and they also just submitted DNA from the Zodiac Killer, so that's... Well, that's they submitted pretty... material that they hope yields a DNA yeah. profile. We'll see. They haven't been able right. to do that in the past. From uh, I'm letters, not optimistic. Right? From the letters, yeah. I'm not optimistic either because of the... Uh, I mean, listen, anything can happen. I mean, it did. It just did with this case. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was also a guy that... Bo he, he, he was good at, at covering his tracks if he didn't necessarily know about DNA at the time, but whether he licked that envelope or not, we don't even know if that was him that sent the stuff, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could find a guy and go all the way there and find him and just like, yeah, I was just it's messing around. Yeah. yeah. Was there any time while you were working with Michelle that you felt like she was going at it a little too, little too aggressively and you had to rein her in a bit? No, because I identified. So, you know, I did the same thing. I was obsessed to the same extent. I think that, you know, I didn't have, like, a family, um, you know, and I think that probably made it more difficult for her to invest in this completely, as completely as she did. You know, this is sort of the thing that you do late at night, and when you have to be up in the morning to bring your daughter to school, and then, you know, you have uh, sort of, I don't know, household responsibilities, it's very different. Yeah, no, I wasn't going to tell that woman to do anything. <laughs> she was, she was going to be on it, and she was going to be, she was going to just keep going. You know, we definitely had discussions as far as which paths to, to focus on, um, and I, I really think you should focus on this more than that, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, if she, if she saw something, she was going to run with it. It seems like she did most of her investigation the right way, the, the proper way. And I know just after reading the book and seeing the results, uh, you know, of uh, D'Angelo being caught, and I know that the people out there, just because you're here and you're, you're in the true crime community, it's, in, it's inspirational to see what she did. 
Um, do you find yourself in a position where you're, you're giving advice to people because they want to do what she's done? No, I would dissuade them from doing what she's done, actually. There are more practical ways to use your time. Yeah. Not I, that I embrace <laughs> practicality, but. <laughs> you know, I would, uh, in, a, in, the, in the sense where she wasn't, we constantly have this thing with citizen detectives of people breaking that, that wall of, is, is this the guy where you, they put out a name? And if she would have done that for every name mm -hmm. that she had gotten that she thought she was close with, you know, like we saw with the, the Boston bombing, um, that would be awful. You know, she didn't do that. That's the number one rule of being a citizen detective is you don't do that. And you also have to understand that if you do have a name and you give it to the police, they're not going to give you anything back. And you might not ever hear from them for a year. And they might not ever give you credit. Um, you just have to go to sleep and say, you know what, I think I helped on that case and that's it. You know, the quandary is that becoming a citizen detective is, is not a rational thing at all. Um, but you need to be rational in order to effectively, you know, investigate a case like this. So you find very few people doing what Michelle and I have done who are also like rational and kind of, you know, stable. But here, the, th the, th the special thing about Michelle and you is that you guys were able to communicate with the police and you did build that relationship, which is very, very rare for it citizens is. detectives Absolutely. to do. Yeah. I mean, it depends on... I help a lot with a lot of different police departments and it's 50-50. It's you know, sometimes you get a guy and it becomes a real partnership and it's like, I have these skills that can help and I've been able to help solve murders and then United Kingdom, what the fuck? All right, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, that's the Jack the Ripper. Scotland that's Yard. the Jack the Ripper yeah. case calling. Yeah, I'm sorry, I gotta go. Uh, but, um, you know. Phone booth outside, you can change it. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's... Um, you, you have to, you know, being a citizen detective, if you go in and it's really, you can't go and say you're a citizen detective. You say you're a victim's advocate, and that's what I do, and I separate myself as a journalist and, a, and as a victim's advocate, and I've been a victim's advocate for a really long time. Um, I'm a media advisor for the parents of murdered children, and, and I've worked with them for a long time, and uh, it's, what you have to do is you have to say, I'm working with this family. I want to do this investigation. I use social media a lot on it. And uh, I, what I always ask the detective is, am I, am I going to spook somebody? Because I don't want to spook anybody if you're close. And sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no, or sometimes they won't, won't call you back. If they don't call you back and you give them three or four days, then you just run with it because screw them. If they say no, uh, don't do it, hold off, then I hold off, absolutely, because I don't want to screw up anything. If they say yes, we need all the help we can get, then we go with it. And some of them have been really, really good. You know, I got... You know, we're searching for this one guy, this one fugitive, and uh, he was like, hey, good job. All right, let's go get this guy now. And it's like, you know, that's the thing that I'm going to be. I'm going to be building that page on the plane back home. Wow. Yeah. Is Are, there a follow-up book coming? Um, I think there's a follow-up uh, chapter or, or two to this one. Yeah, there's definitely, I think they wanted to, they knew that we were on all of this craziness. And then this just happened. This was just very serendipitous. So the, the media stuff had started to die down. Of course, uh, Bill Cosby happened like maybe Same 24 time. hours later. One which rapist was, preempting another. Yeah. Um, and it was really sad too because Jane um, was there at CNN to do an interview and then she got bumped because the Cosby news happened. So it's oh, just wow. like, well, she got bumped because another rapist had just been, just been caught. So what a time to be alive. What a time right. to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, she had a good, good sense of humor about it, but, uh, we'll see. I think uh, definitely it's going to happen. You know, we're going to, I have no doubt that on Monday it's going to be like, Hey, welcome back from crime con. All right, let's go. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the way you described him when you said that, you know, he's been conditioned to sit in one spot. Mm hmm. Uh, the way you said that made me think of the way he is now, and maybe he's just content sitting in one spot and not saying anything and just dying. They could be. Yeah. yeah. Which would, I think that's what would make me, sort of like what you were saying, that, that's what would make me hate him. Is well, that he's, he's on got, heavy suicide watch, too. Right. Like, yeah. that would make, I feel that, like, no, that, me hate him as if want. he just copped out. Yeah. I, think, I think you want to, this is such an opportunity to uh, dig in and explore the mind of someone so mad. Yeah, and it, it provides a wealth of insight into, yeah. you know, future or other cases that are like this. Right. But just based on his past behavior, he seems perfectly content to just yeah. sit in one I mean, place. I see, 
I, sure. see, I see it as a bit more of an act, and, and I think he's setting up another escape route. His escape route now would be maybe being in a hospital as opposed to being in a jail cell. Um, I'll be obviously a, a prison hospital, but it would be, everybody knows the prison hospitals are a little bit nicer than the yeah. jail cells. So he was constantly, every place that he would break into, he knew the various escape routes, and this is just one of them. Now I'm leaving that way. Mm -hmm. So nice. are you guys hashtag hot for holes? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I was hot for holes before this even happened. Did you get my tweet last now night? Now it's I dig holes. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. That's the new one. I dig holes. I might I have drunkenly <laughs> tweeted Billy last night, like, have you seen Paul Holes? Send it my way, please. <laughs> yes, I, you did that. I, 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 I certainly will. <laughs> so he was one of the uh, investigators that has uh, helped recently, right? He's been working on for 20 years, Paul Holes. Absolutely, yes. No, Paul was the one that he, he was the one that was constantly and really wrote us after Michelle died. He, he was at Michelle's memorial, wrote us about Michelle, saying that I very much considered her my partner in this. And they would share a ton of information. And he was the one that put it into Jed Match and, and uh, got the hit. And Finally opened the right door. Opened the right door. No. And he, uh, you know, he was actually just retiring, right? You know, yeah. And, uh, what a way to retire. Yeah, yeah that was the like... ultimate mic drop in the history of all law enforcement. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I became hot for holes when, uh, w after the case that got solved, and I was still reading the book, and, uh, and I, Michelle is riding along with him, and she asks him, do you think he might have gone to school around here or anything like that, based on his uh, attack schedule uh, versus a college um, schedule, I believe. And uh, he's like, yeah, probably Sac State. And that's where he went. Mm -hmm. That that mm -hmm. was the moment I became hot for holes. Okay, <laughs> yeah. It's an odd moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like I like jumped up. I'm like, how are these people so smart? <laughs> <laughs> I like how you said you were hot for holes before it became a thing, and like 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 I saw Nirvana before they started selling. Yeah, it. yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. I saw. Yeah, no. I I would always describe him because I was you know working on TV. I'm in a show called Crime Watch Daily too, and I would always describe him as like, he's, he's, he's great on camera and he's got these great blue eyes, because he really does, he's got these great blue eyes. So it's always constantly doing that. So now it's like hot for holes, it's like, where were you guys? Yeah, you know, and I was all- Is this a real hashtag? I was oh, all, okay, okay, I was okay, all okay. there. there, there there's, I'll show you the t-shirts that people are making. I thought you <laughs> just made that, I no, really no, no, I'm not that, I'm not that cool. <laughs> um, we have like five minutes left. If anyone's got any questions, um, feel free. Got a couple mics in the middle of the, uh, in the aisle here. Nope, you don't want to be on a mic. Theories on why uh, he know, stopped. These offenders sometimes stop. He was 40 years old um, when he committed the last known murder in 1986. Um, we, we've seen with BCK, Green River, West Side Rapist, um, these offenders are able to stop. And usually it's, it's a confluence of um, physical decline, diminished libido, which, which I think is the impetus for most of these offenders. Um, this, the East Air Rapist had a few cl close calls um, in 1981 with Sherry Domingo and Greg Sanchez. Greg Sanchez put up quite a, f a fight, as did Janelle Cruz. And I think, you know, with fenders like this, the stakes at that age, they have families, they have children, a lot of them have careers. We have no idea what this guy was doing in the 80s between his tenure as a cop and working uh, as a mechanic for Save Mart. But, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's all of those things. You know, it's like the traditional wisdom has been these offenders can't stop unless, you know, they die or they're incarcerated. But, you know, that's that's proven to be a myth. Man. I would not be surprised. I hope at some point in time, uh, family is interviewed. And I do think that they are victims also. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he had raped his daughter, if his grandchild could be his daughter. Yeah, I, I wouldn't characterize him as a pedophile. There were two victims that were 13, but I mean, really, a pedophile is, is someone who victimizes children. Um, so I don't know that I would describe him that way. Um, and also, you know, if if he had abused his daughters, I think that would have made him vulnerable to arrest and being connected to this series. I, I think he was too smart to to do that. 
And how, am I mistaken in thinking there were only two murders after the birth of his child, his first child? So when his wife was pregnant with their first child, there was there was this, the penultimate murder of Sherry Domingo and Greg, Greg Sanchez, and then when she was pregnant with their second child, that's when Janelle Cruz was murdered. What year was that? Uh, the first was 86. The second child was born in 80. Uh, sorry, the first was born in 80, 81. The second was born in 86. The third was born in 89. But again, there are no known crimes after uh, 86. Hey. hey. I just, hey. <laughs> um, I'm just we have a thing. If the, if the wheelchair catatonic thing is just a shtick that he's doing to get sympathy, mm, what are the possibly. chances that the jury, I mean, the jury won't be the crime con attendees. <laughs> so is it possible, do you think, that they will or one of them will fall for that? No, I don't think it's going to be a jury. I think there's going to be a, a, a deal. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he, he does not like attention. Uh, he does not yeah. want to be in the courtroom with, with cameras and all that stuff. He's not going to want that. He's going to just say, you know what, I'm 72 years old. Which is, which, you know, it's bad that he's 72 years old because there's not much that they can offer him. You yeah. know, if the juror did fall stuff. for that, they'd be pretty fucking stupid. Yeah. Can I say that? On your yeah. You just did. Right. Yeah. We've <laughs> seen, which, which, by the way, as a public service announcement, never, ever try to get out of jury duty because you should never complain about a juror being stupid. Always go to jury duty because you guys are the smart ones in the room. Good right point. On. Thank you. I don't know. I, I think it could be a coincidence. We also know that his uh, step family, his uh, stepfather's um, siblings and nephews and nieces lived all throughout Orange County. One of them lived about four miles from that attack. So that's as plausible an explanation. Yeah. I mean, it's incredibly so eerie coincidence, but um, you know, being four houses away uh, from, uh, you know, but weirder things have happened. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for Thanks, joining guys. us here today. Thank you to Billy, Paul, and Thank Maggie. Thank you, guys. Thank you.